problem with determinism is it says uh, everything can't happen anyway except the way that it's happening. Now the problem with that is that it makes the concept of thinking irrelevant. <laughs> because you're thinking what you're thinking because you couldn't think anything else. Therefore, the notion of truth or, or uh, judgment or all of that is completely shot down. So a totally determined universe is the most ultimately uninteresting that there can be. Uh, nevertheless, the universe clearly is, to some degree, highly determined. I mean, we know to within nanoseconds the time of the sunrise tomorrow. And uh, unless there's a serious instability, it will be on time. So there is a degree of predictability. Um, m my rap is sort of divided into two parts, and I'm very shy about the second half. The first half is easy for me. It's that psychedelics are wonderful, you should take them, this is the way to save the world, so forth and so on. The second part of the rap is, here's what I've learned from psychedelics, and then not some general kind of feel-good thing, but something that requires a blackboard and tensor equations of the third degree and so forth and so on. And I'm very shy about putting that out. My personal approach to psychedelics before I realized that you could save the world with them, when I just thought that this was some kind of thing, self-exploration. My notion was what it's good for is ideas. It's for generating ideas. And I don't really like the word generating because you don't generate them, you hunt them. You get in your little boat and you paddle out onto the dark water and then you know you put your feet up and you wait and you set your nets and you wait and uh, you know sometimes you pull up your nets and something the size of a freight train has gone through them and you just row for sure shit in <laughs> white and sometimes you know minnows trivia you know, why, do, why does our little finger just fit our nostril? And, you know, the, the mysteries of the animal body, or all kinds of stuff. But occasionally, and it's worth fishing a lifetime, you know, occasionally something will come into the nets that is not so small as to be trivial and not so large as to be incomprehensible. And this thing can be wrestled with for hours and eventually brought home to show the startled folks back on shore. And this showing the startled folks back on shore is, uh, makes history. All these ideas come out of interaction with these plants. Uh, the number of ideas, which when you pick up a straight encyclopedia, are to be traced back to uh, herders and people who kept animals. People say, you know, astrology, astronomy. It was invented by people watching their flocks. The calendar, time, was invented by people watching their flocks. All this other, well, they weren't only watching their flocks, they were also watching the uh, cow pies of their flocks for mushrooms. <laughs> and, uh, you know, music, all of these Pythagorean insights into order, I think, come out of uh, this this herding, domesticated animal husbandry, we call it, husbandry, because it's a model of caring for nature. And um, these ideas are the inspiration and the purpose, to my mind, I mean, the, the social purpose, because I can, you know, get rid of my stuff and feel better about how I was abused in childhood and this and that and the other thing with psychedelics. But that's all personal growth stuff. But an idea, you know, can be shared. You can take it and you can lay it at somebody's feet. There are, and, uh, and where do they come from? You know, when you ask the question, where do the ideas come from? This is Platonic Philosophy 101, ladies and gentlemen. This is why the Greeks gave up fishing.
to discuss this problem where do the ideas come from and we are no closer to understanding that and yet the ideas are the signposts of our destiny they guide us forward and yet we know not from whence nor whither well I think now uh, you know so Plato's take on that was he said well there must be a perfect world somewhere where all these things exist in some and the numbers and everything there's a perfect form for everything in a higher dimensional world called the archetypes well 2,000 years of, of uh, philosophical sophistication have shown certain problems with that point of view but fewer than you might think I mean the mystery of form the problem of form what is it where does it come from what sustains it we are nothing more than form if it weren't for form we would be no different than the dirt under our feet and form intrudes into matter and then it withdraws and when it withdraws they put you in a hole and put dirt on top of you so you know, it's very important to understand what is this coming and going of form if we take this pillow and saw it in two it's pretty um, it's a pretty undramatic event if we take one of us and saw us in two it's an extremely dramatic event and what is the difference there it's that this object is three-dimensional and this object is four-dimensional this object has a quality about it called being alive being alive also technically known as metabolism means that material is moving along temporal gradients within the confines of this organism material is not moving along any gradients within this thing it's just where it is there it sits but in here a form is being maintained from within and if I were to die the form would collapse here no form is being maintained except the form imposed this is an imposed form it has no sense of itself and it doesn't sustain itself from any kind of internal integrity but higher dimensional objects like animals and plants and human beings have this quality well so then what we've been talking about here uh, albeit sloppily is uh, the fact that we seem to occupy a higher dimension in the natural order than other things and this higher dimension has to do with the fact that we have a little piece of mind a little chunk of this higher order organization well then going toward that as visionaries as users of psychedelics society keeps um, adjusting its trim tabs as it were to mirror this transcendental goal and this is what we want to become we want to become like the sensed object in our imagination and shamanism is a pipeline about this it's almost as though the the end state well here's here's a model for it it's almost as though the ordinary causal flow of information from the past to the future must make a place for like a three to five percent backward flow and this is what we call intuition it's that vague unformed knowing that comes without any baggage of causal mechanism but it kept but it's true knowledge you know how it's going to be well it may be that inform that time is somehow information permeable that future potential states of existence are actually somehow in resonance with states of existence in the present and in the past our models of how the world works are very very simple I mean basically we operate with mechanical push-pull uh, uh, models that are appropriate to very simple mechanical systems and yet we know that we are far more complex even than uh, you know the most complex physical systems like this this last 15,000 years has been something and the last 500 years has really been something 
it's so close now, the transcendental object, that it informs everything. The, the, me the metaphor, the model to hold on in your mind as you gaze at, uh, at the earth in its travail is the metaphor of birth, not death. That uh, a gestation process of 20,000 years is coming to an end. Culture using, language using, minded uh, creatures are coming to some kind of uh, fermentative climax. And we cannot extrapolate the human career on this planet centuries into the future. It ain't going to be like that. It, it, it's an absurd question to ask the question, what will the, what will the world be like in 500 years? What the world will be like in 500 years is unimaginable because in the next 40 years we are going to pass through this quantized transition where we actually become insiders and players in the game. History is a state of becoming. It's a state of moving from the inarticulate, unreflecting, animal style of organization to the self-reflecting, minded, conscious, energy controlling style. But to get from one to the other takes about 20,000 years and it's a bitch. You don't know where you are. You don't know up from down. You cannot tell what is happening. There's just migrations and warfare and pogroms and gene mixing and hysteria of every sort and messiah this and religion that and they're slaughtering these people and these people are doing that. And it's like a bad dream. It's like a psychedelic trip is what it's like. It's a 15 to 25,000 year dash to authentic being from the animal body. And it would have been a lot easier to understand if 10,000 years ago we hadn't cut the telephone wire to nature. Because from then on we haven't been able to figure out what's going on. And it's been left to men with large egos to figure out what was going on. And what they figured out was going on was that there was a lot of free women, land, animals, and money that needed to be organized for their pleasure because they lost the connection to this planetary birth process. Now, uh, and like a birth process, I mean, the metaphor is worth pursuing because a birth is violent, blood is shed, there's moaning and groaning and thrashing around. And yet this is not uh, an automobile accident. This is not a human tragedy. This is how life works. This is centrally scripted in to how human beings operate. If this didn't happen, we wouldn't be here. Well, that's the... And yet, you know, if you've ever been pregnant or been around a pregnant person... This is a wonderful state of equilibrium, of self-satisfaction, of completion. And yet, it, the very fact that it exists ensures that it's going to be rent. It's going to be torn. It's going to end violently in separation of these two beings. But then there are all kinds of births. There's stillbirth, the most disturbing and unsettling of all. There's, you know, breach. There's cesarean, there's bad presentation, there's all, there's easy labors, hard labors. And I think this is the choice that we are, we still have some choices left. And a choice still to be made is, is it going to be a hard labor or an easy labor? It's how fast we educate ourselves. That's the lubrication in the birth canal of this pup. How fast we educate ourselves. Are we going to fight it? Or are we going to go with it? And it's, it's really frightening. I mean, because what we want is, first of all, forgiveness for what we've done, which ain't likely to come. And then we want to go back and paint ourselves blue and be tribal and turn our back on all of this. But I don't think it's going to be like that. It's propelling us to some kind of higher order. I 
the faith is that history must have been for something and that uh, everything is to be knitted together and everything is to be reborn anew and I don't think this is a, this is not a religious doctrine exactly it's more like a the biological faith I mean we see it everywhere we see it in the birth that I was just describing we see it in the metamorphosis of insects uh, you know Heraclitus said Pantit Rea all flows and I think that this is the the hardest thing to learn it certainly has been the hardest thing for me to learn in my life and I assume then by extrapolation maybe this is one of the hard things to come to terms with everything flows nothing lasts I mean not the travail not the horror you know not the women you love not the women who drive you crazy not the children you love not the children that drive you crazy everything is in the process of changing into something else even at the very moment that you recognize its uh, its uh, coherence as an entity and this is the bad news that the ego doesn't want to hear this is what the ego is created to deny because the ego is you know it's the effort of flesh to make diamond and it can't be done you cannot make an indestructible adamantine clear substance it can't be done but uh, it's all tied up with our fear of death you know we s assume that if we release ourselves into this flow we will be swept away that our identity will cease to exist that we will somehow not be there this is a an artifact of language it's a horrible misunderstanding about who we are and how uh, how the whole system is working are you using language as a meta word <coughs> more than just a syntactic you know, that we're using it? well no that's all I mean but I'm really aware of what a funny thing it is you know you talk about other dimensions language is like an informational creature of some sort I mean languages live they reproduce themselves it's virus. yes it's a kind of virus William Burroughs said this yeah. he said English is a virus from outer space I have no quarrel with this this mm -hmm. seems entirely reasonable uh, it, it, it's a very strange thing reality is made out of language and for most of the people in this room it's made out of English and yet we spend a great deal of time worrying about quarks and, and <coughs> mu mesons and electromagnetic radiation and, and all this is entirely a fiction none of this stuff exists all that exists are words and we play a game a really fairly insidious game with ourselves we all I suppose here give great credence to what is called quantum physics is there anyone here who would care to explain to the group uh, several of the core doctrines of quantum <laughs> physics or any core doctrine and by explain I don't mean a verbal gloss I mean give us the hardcore equations well I no one seems to be coming forth and yet this is our truth how crazy are you if your truth is something you can't even understand and that's the situation that we're in we believe that somewhere among us somebody understands these tensor equations of the third degree and that if it got real tight we could go to them and they would then explain what reality is well this is a head full of shit this kind of thinking what you are actually dealing with is what Wittgenstein called the present at hand the present at hand good phrase because it, it implies that only that which can be grasped matters 
and the quark cannot be grasped, the new meson, the electromagnetic field, none of this. These things need to be understood for what they are, which is little shingles, little shingles, which we epoxy on to the face of the universal mystery. And once you have a bunch of these little shingles epoxied onto the face of the mystery, then you can't see the mystery at all anymore, <laughs> and you call that an explanation. You say, well, that's taken care of. We've explained it. By the time a child is eight or nine or five or six, they have covered the entirety of reality with these interlocking little linguistic tiles. And nowhere now is reality to be found between ourselves and reality as quickly as we possibly can, we erect a, a lie. We erect a false set of assumptions that are culture bound. And this has always impressed me, the culture bound nature of language, that in a way you can never leave the place you're raised in because you acquire a local language. And the local language is all you ever really have. Mm. I had an experience of this that brought it home to me very strongly because when I first went to the tropics, um, I was there as a professional butterfly collector and it was pretty important to make a living. And, uh, and uh, my impression of the jungle was that it was green. That was my impression. Well, then three years later, I went back with botanists. Well, if you know anything about botany and taxonomy, what it is, is it's, a, it's an orgy of language. I mean, you know, leaves are lanceolate, uh, crenolate, they have bracts which are sessile, umbilate, and indentified, and so forth and so on. These are specialized words to describe structure. You go with a botanist into the jungle, and the jungle becomes unbelievably rich. Here are melanostomes, malfigs, varolas, uh, all kinds of things. And as soon as you put words to it, reality emerges. So you see, here is language as a double-edged sword. Out of the undifferentiated, it creates miraculous new realities to which we immediately habituate undervalue and profane. In other words, familiarity breeds contempt. But somewhere between silence and the familiarity that breeds contempt is the living essence of the word and its meaning. This problem of language is uh, central, I think, to understanding uh, the psychedelic experience. What I see happening on these tryptamines is the project of language goes from being something which you hear to something which you see without ever crossing over a quantized moment of transition. Well, this is to my mind absolutely astonishing and I think I'm a pretty tough nut to crack. When you see language your, your, it's amazing because it's a paranormal thing or it's like it's, it cheats. It achieves paranormal intensity without violating any of the laws of physics that I'm familiar with. What I'm talking about is that in these shamanic performances in the Amazon and on psilocybin, uh, language goes from something beheld to something seen. Uh, there's precedent for this. In the Hellenistic world of, of Greco-Romanism, the be-all and the end-all of spiritual accomplishment was what's called the Logos. And the Logos was an informing voice, a voice in the head that told you the right way to live. And Plato and all of these heavies cultivated and achieved connection with the Logos. Well, there was an a Alexandrian Jew named Philo Judaeus who was a great commentator on the religions of his period. And he wrote uh, about what he called the more perfect logos. 
the more perfect logos. And he said, what is the more perfect logos? And then he answered his own question. The more perfect logos goes from being heard to being seen without ever crossing over a quantized moment of transition. Language is something unfinished in us. It's something that was catalyzed out of animal organization by hallucinogenic activation of brain states, and it is something that is in the act of perfecting itself. And when it is completed, my faith is that words will be seen, not heard. The whole way in which we organize our language around visual metaphors when we talk about clarity. So if someone is able to communicate, we say, she spoke clearly. That's a visual metaphor. We say, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. That means I understand you. I see what you mean. He painted a picture. It means unconsciously, at the unconscious level, we connect visual metaphors and the visual sense with clarity of understanding. And what's happening in the ayahuasca cults, in the mushroom intoxications and so forth, is an invocation of the visible logos. It comes into being in the shared space. You control it with sound. I mean, you, you discover that sound is something that you can see. And this is, I referred to this this morning and when I talked about how we may be a one gene mutation away from a transformation of language. You can sit, feel perfectly normal, not feel wired or depressed, not have visual activity in the visual field, and then you generate a tone like and you see that it's a certain shade of lemon yellow with a chartreuse edge running on it. And then you and it shifts to pink blue. Well, you begin to experiment with this and you discover very quickly that you can do more than just generate colors, you can generate modalities, you can generate shapes as you begin to relax into an unconscious expression of syntax, form begins to behave itself in the space in front of you. And that language may have existed a very long time before anybody got the idea that you could use a certain sound like glass to mean a certain complex object because on psilocybin uh, glossolalia is frequently triggered glossolalia is normally presented as speaking in tongues a religious phenomenon of fundamentalism and the fundamentalist spin on it is that these are ancient biblical languages and that you're being um, possessed by an angel or something but in fact at the primitive level of religion worldwide, glossolalia is frequently met with. And all of us have an ability to relax away from meaning and still retain syntax. It's just something you would never do because we're programmed to always mean something when we speak. But in fact, babies don't do this at all. They, they love to babble. And they only late in the process learn to attach meaning. Well, so then under the under language in the humble service of meaning, there is language uh, for itself, sort of the ding on siche of language. And... Uh, well, I'll give an example of it and then discuss what's going on. Nide gewond wai haksikevich ni mulgom vuapaketen didikini hipikektet e dejigeve wai ham bikikitit ef mu ulktive indidikt kwa havagenke kifidut ulmikin dital. Okay, now what's happening here? First of all, Ordinarily, we associate this speed of vocal noise with words. Words are small mouth noises. That's all they are. 
You see, if you're going to have a creature which communicates among members of its species, you have to have a low energy form of communication. Otherwise, you'd be exhausted from the effort to communicate. Well, small mouth noises are great. A person can talk for about 12 hours without stopping fairly effortlessly. I mean, if you've got water and a little dope rolled, and uh, it's, it's not a problem. Well, do you know how much information a person could convey in 12 hours if they were, say, reading the telephone book aloud? It's pretty amazing. Uh, so this thing I just did, it had syntax, but it had no meaning. In other words, if you listen to it, you hear that sounds repeat, rhythms repeat, there appear to be prefixes, suffixes, certain kinds of declensions. It's all there, folks. It just doesn't mean anything. But it turns out that the activity of language feels like language, whether it means anything or not. Well, in the psychedelic state, you discover uh, this same set of tinker toys that was used to create the little speech I just did can be used to create sculptures that are free form that uh, this this he why waxi cuvini malhakti kipipit it looks a certain way what's important is not how it sounds what's important is how it looks in the Amazon in these ayahuasca cults they have what they call ikaros magical songs ikaros are uh, visual art. They are intended that way, and they're criticized that way, and their success or failure is judged entirely in the visual domain, and yet they are made out of sound. And what they convey are very complex feelings. You could almost say three-dimensional feelings feeling so complex that they won't lay down and be a sound like hate, fear, revulsion. They won't do that. They can only be laid out as grammatical objects of a higher order. And I think that um, this process is happening in human beings, the push toward visible language, but it's being accelerated by the psychedelics and that th we are trying to become for each other visual objects and we are trying to become uh, capable of generating these things. Now why I hold these conclusions is because in the DMT flash, which is the most intense quintessence, most quintessential distillation of this kind of stuff, you encounter the shamanic entities, the spirits, the ancestors. And this is really confounding. I mean, we can put up with shifting cobwebs of color and weird insights about our nostrils and our little fingers, but not entities. And yet, in that space, these things exist. And they're preaching this ontological transformation of language. This is how entities in hyperspace communicate. It's as though everything has had one dimension added on to it. It's as though we are existing in some kind of squashed version of a larger superspace that can simply be mentally unfolded through the act of encountering a psychedelic substance. I think it's big news that these entities exist. Uh, now, if you were to go to a shaman in a classical culture and say, what, what, what's, what's it about? What's going on here? They would unhesitatingly tell you that these are the ancestors. Say, oh, yes, these are the ancestors. We, were, we cure using the ancestors. And this is, I think, very unsettling for us as Westerners. It, we'd much rather accept the notion of friendly extraterrestrials communicating through the mushroom than that this is the dearly departed. I mean, that really, you can feel your boundaries beginning to quake against that possibility. 
It was very interesting. Recently, there was a new edition of uh, Evans Vence's The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, which if you've never read it, it's quite an interesting book. Y.E. Evans Vence was an American who became a great scholar of Mahayana Buddhism and wrote the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Tibetan Book of the Great Liberation, Tibetan Yoga and Secret Doctrines, and so forth. But his doctoral thesis when he was a young folklore student at Cambridge in 1911 was he wanted to study the fairy faith. And he went to Brittany and Wales and Ireland and interviewed the oldest people in the districts, the crones and the old, old people. And it's a wonderful uh, book to read because these people just tell these stories and it's absolutely convincing. I mean, the fairies are real, the fairy faith is real. And when you asked, when, when Evans Vance asked these people, you know, what's going on? They said, uh, well, these are, de these are the dead. When you die, you, you stay around, but you're in an invisible realm, and it's an ecology of souls. My phrase, not his, an ecology of souls. But this is what is revealed on DMT, is entities that are so strange that they could easily pass for extraterrestrials. What's puzzling about them is their tremendous humor and affection and intense involvement in us as human beings. Why are they there? What do they want? And they're not, uh, if they are ancestors, they're not my ancestors. In other words, when I broke in there, I didn't find my mother and my grandparents. It wasn't like that. There was no personal... It isn't like that. But there is this sense of uh, affection, interest, caring. Well, we have the doctrine of purgatory in Western theology in the Catholic Church. I had always assumed, thinking about it, that, that purgatory must have been a doctrine that the church fathers, Irenaeus and Eusebius and that crowd, had written into the, the gospel message for their own purposes. I discovered, to my amazement, that that isn't what happened at all, that St. Patrick is the person responsible for purgatory because he, he wrote purgatory into Christian doctrine in order to convert the Celtic peasantry of Ireland to the idea that fairyland and the Christian afterlife were the same place. And it was thought such a good idea in Rome that the doctrine became canon law generally for the church. So, so purgatory is a spruced up, cleaned up version of Irish fairyland to, to make it a little more palatable. Well, you see, we, th this is where our anxieties come in and where it, it's hard to push it much further than this. An extraterrestrial contact, I think we could probably ride that through and it would be amazing, but it would be tolerable. But if what's happening is that at the end of history are waiting the dead and that our notion of reality is so skewed that we don't even know the most basic facts about the cycles of life and death and rebirth, then it's going to be uh, quite astonishing for us, I think, to come to terms with this. And yet, this is what, uh, this is what shamans live with. This is they, what they tell you. They say, you know, a shaman is a person who can pass daily through the gates of death and return. We see into the other realm. We see into hyperspace. As inheritors of the rational tradition, this is pretty hard for us to swallow because I think, I mean, maybe it's not true anymore, but in my personal process of rejecting Catholicism, I did manage to convince myself that when you dead, it's over with. And it's been very hard for me to fight my way back to the notion that that might be just 100% malarkey. 
and nothing more than a conservative first try. And now I think much more in terms of dimensionality and that I don't know what a form is, but the process of the fertilization of an egg, of any organism, it doesn't have to be a human being, the life of that organism, and then its death and dissolution, is the process of a form descending from hyperspace, clothing itself in matter, and then withdrawing from, from matter, returning to hyperspace. And this concept of hyperspace is very, very necessary to understanding this stuff. Because if you look at what shamans do that is so confounding, they find lost objects, they cure disease, they rescue lost souls, they discern uh, secret acts, infidelities, thefts, poisonings, stuff like that. All of these magical things that they do are completely non-mysterious if we grant the idea of a higher spatial dimension. I mean, if, if, we, if there's a higher spatial dimension, then, you know, this section is not zipped. There's a part of it which is completely open to the world. This room is not closed. There's one direction in which it's absolutely open to the air. In other words, in hyperspace, nothing is hidden. Yeah. Give yourself a chance to, to breathe for a moment. Uh, why do you think it is? I mean, we, we as human beings uh, have evolved with pretty much all the equipment we need to, to go along and do things. So why do you think it is with, that we have evolved with such a poor understanding or, or no understanding of, of these matters of which you speak? The, uh, the afterlife, uh, the rebirth. I mean, we hear it. We, many people, they hear it and, and they have a curiosity and they go towards it. But few people understand it. Well, I, I think this is a very recent phenomenon uh, of, uh, you know, it, culture is a narrowing, obviously. I mean, if a man can have ten wives, two wives, no wives, one wife, well, then you go into a culture, you're going to make a choice. And all, all cultures represent narrowing of choices. Uh, we don't know how we could be. We don't know what we could be if we were free to evolve ourselves. I think that's the, the starting line that we're edging up on. We're about to have a chance to create a global culture, to decide, to, to essentially clean our basement and decide what we're going to save and what we're going to keep. Uh, this sense of not being connected is, to my mind, entirely rooted to what I've said here several times, the problem of the ego, but then to, you know, get a little more specific and maybe slightly more offensive, uh, it, it's the monotheistic religions that have to take a real knock for the present situation. Uh, monotheism as a philosophical reflex is understandable but simple-minded. I mean, it's what an eight-year-old would get to, you know, I mean, one God, reasonable, economical, seems to fit the situation pretty well. So what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with it is you've got to be a little more uh, uh, sensitive. Philosophy is not practiced in a void. And as Jungians know well, we mirror ourselves in our gods. Our religions are a set of permissions for how we as individuals can be. And monotheism presents us with a notion that God should be omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, and unforgiving. And male. And male. Well, this is nobody you would invite to a garden party. Th this is what we call an asshole, you know? <laughs> somebody who corners you, who's never wrong, who's totally full of their opinion, who just wants to tell you how the boar ate the cabbage and never doubts themselves. A boor. 
So we have enshrined at the center of our cultural machinery the archetype of the unbearable boor, and then we've gone out uh, to realize it. And uh, we try to fine-tune it. You know, we say, okay, well, this Old Testament religion with all this ritual and dietary, this isn't it. So then along comes Christ and tries to fine-tune it. But, you know, he's working in the most women-repressing, male-dominator, hierarchical structure on the planet. And whatever good he does is quickly wiped out 150 years later by these clowns I mentioned, Eusebius, Irenaeus, and the rest of those guys. And then... Uh, Islam comes along to twist the screws yet tighter on this monotheistic ideal. And um, it doesn't serve. And it was put in place because people tried to figure it out on their own. Monotheism is what you come to if, full of sincerity, you try to figure it out on your own. But if you will just forget being full of sincerity and take mushrooms, <laughs> You will never come to this monotheistic conclusion. Uh, it, it just appears preposterous because the multiplicity, the shifting, unpredictable, boundaryless, maternal nature of things is what forces its uh, presence into your consciousness. We are, we are born in the mystery. It's all around us. Everything is provisional. Uh, and this is something worth talking about, I suppose, because it's a psychedelic point of view. Every society has always believed that it possessed 95% of the truth and that the next 5% would fall into place in the next 15 years. And yet these societies have just been all over the map, you know? And we don't understand anything. Uh, and in fact, we have taken a, a more perverse turn than most we have substituted the incomprehensible. That's why we get these quarks and mu mesons and tensor equations of the third degree. We actually worship incomprehensibility as the highest form of explanation of what's going on. Say, well, I don't know what's going on. Somebody must understand it. Well, I've got news for you. If you don't understand it, what good is it? that somebody understands it somewhere. I mean, you're responsible for yourself. And yet, I think uh, that, you know, all this technology, you know, two and a half billion dollars worth of atom, atom smashers, is, at some level, is being inspired by something transcendental. And is, you know, they're trying to achieve love and Godhead and all that stuff. We want to know we do want to know, and to science's credit, and this is what I love about science, is that it's not kidding itself. I mean, the thing that, the, the thing that I go back to over and over again, and that makes psychedelics different, and that makes what I'm doing different, is you're not asked to believe anything. You just have to do something. In other words, you're invited to perform an experiment, not accept a belief. And uh, taking a psychedelic is an experiment. It's not an act of religious devotion. I mean, you may do it in a devoted and religiously sensitized way, but it's an experiment to see what happens. And if it works, it can be repeated. Uh, delusion is a terrible thing. And the world, there's a lot of it in the world, and probably psychedelics have to take the blame for some of this. I mean, all these rishis, roshis, geishas, and gurus that are running around with their hands out, this is largely, uh, can be put at the feet of psychedelics. But, uh, you mean, why should we blame psychedelics yeah. for this? I don't think anybody would have given any of this a thought if they hadn't had psychedelic experiences yeah. to show them that the mind is not what they assume it to be. I mean, the great impetus to Eastern religion came in the 60s when all of this, uh, all of this stuff was happening. I wanted to ask a little further about the animal experience of time and 
that they are stuck in the point present. They don't have a sense of future or past. And my own experience with uh, marijuana is that I lose my short-term memory. And in my foolish days when I used to try to drive after getting really stoned, I remember looking to the right and it's clear, and I look to the left and it's clear, but I forgot what it is on the right side. <laughs> <laughs> I look to the right and it's clear, but I forgot what it is. Um, and I'm going like this, and I can't hold anything in my mind for even that long. And it's terrible, you know, when you're driving, it's awful. But, but uh, and I, don't, I don't find it pleasant <laughs> in, in, in any sense. Uh, you know, when you read, you forget a paragraph, uh -huh. and you go on to the next paragraph. And I, um, I wondered if that's somewhat like the animal experiences life. Or, and also I wondered if that was an attribute of uh, mushrooms and ayahuasca, that loss of short-term memory. I don't, I don't particularly like that experience. I don't like that either. I really don't like it when it's acute. Uh, but I don't think that's necessarily a part of it. I mean, all, it's, you know, you don't want to try and pigeonhole the psychedelic experience because what it is is it's everything. I mean, once you think you've got it figured out and that it's always going to be this, and then the next time it's completely, uh, completely something else, so much can be done. So much can be structured and learned. I mean, I think basically the kind of psychedelic experiences most of us have been having have been just reconnoitering. You know, we sail over the territory and photograph the landscape and take it back and study it. But what you could do if you landed down there, what you could do if you actually learned the way of it, is I think, uh, you know, it's very inviting in spite of the fact that psychedelics have been around for, you know, 50,000, 100,000 years, I still can't shake the impression that it's going to have a historical impact. That, that you know, they're going to eventually get around to noticing how odd it is and noticing that it's right in the center of ourselves. The, the real problem is getting the word out about what it is. So many people have taken a little bit of LSD or a little bit of psilocybin or something, and then they think they know what the psychedelic experience is. But you have to spend time poking around, and you have to take chances, and eventually the ice will break underneath you, and to your absolute horror, the thing you have been trying to cause to happen will then happen. But you almost always have to trick yourself trap yourself into it. I don't know what the limit of this stuff is. I certainly have been as stoned as I ever want to get. I mean, I said at the time, let it be noted. I don't ever want to be more loaded than this. <clears throat> yeah. The film that I'm trying to get produced in its um, message side. It deals with the issue of what do we let go of and what do we hold on to in this shrink shrinking world of our own ethnic heritage. And as the world shrinks, there's a move towards uh, homogeneity. And what's really happening right now is people are really pulling back into their in-group. I mean, the Muslims have done this most profoundly because it's very frightening. They have to all become one. And the idea of all being a consumer white bread homogeneity is a, a, a horrible image, but um, the thing that people are willing to share, I find, is their cuisine. Everybody's willing to eat and explore and relish in each other's food, but the thing that nobody's willing to give up, or few are willing to give up, are their languages. And you, know, you can see they're talking about Quebec uh, seceding again from Canada, and it's, but that there's something about uh, our attachment to language that's really uh, potent. And uh, you're giving up not just, uh, I mean, it's a world view. It is really our self. I mean, that, our, that we also are made of language. I said the world is made of language. Note that you are part of that world and are made of language. I don't know whether the appetite for stuff will drive people to abandon their fear of merging. I, I think, you know, a lot is going to be lost. A lot has been lost. I mean, the, the ex 
extinction of the mammals that began 50,000 years ago. It was 50,000 years ago that was the greatest number of mammal species on Earth. There's been steadily falling species since about that time, mostly due to human predation. And, you know, we're not going to bring back the giant ground sloth and the woolly mammoth and the glyptodont. They're gone for good. And uh, there's no getting away from the poignancy of this process. Uh, the cruise is over. We're in the lifeboats. The ship is going to sink. The question is, how does this adventure end? But there's no question that there's going to be a lot of loss and redefinition. I mean, usually in these weekends we get to a place where it comes down to being, you know, this thing about the, the space issue. Because people love it and they hate it. And it has a lot to do with how you relate to the male ego. Because it's the engineering dream come true, you know. That, and nature disappears. You replace it with black vacuum. And you say, here we will erect the, the palaces and whorehouses of the human imagination. We can make them the size of moons. We can do this and that. But, uh, and the beauty that w is within us gives me a lot of hope for that. My God, the, the expression of the design process in this world is certainly awful. I mean, we, our world is visually hideous, the part of it touched by human beings. But that's very puzzling to me, because when you take psychedelics, you discover within the human body-mind the same kind of transcendent beauty that you see in the rainforest and the Arctic tundra and all that. I mean, immense beauty, and yet we seem to have a very hard time translating it into the design process. Art is, uh, you know, we haven't really talked that much about art in relationship to all this, but the politics of the situation here in this mil millennial crisis, I think the, res the reasonable response is to push the art pedal right through the floor. The way to escape the present cul-de-sac is an enormous outbreak of creativity of all sorts. We just need to overwhelm ourselves with creative expression. This could be very easily done. We've been in the habit of binding about 60% of our social energy into a standing crop of weapons. And, you know, whatever creativity is expressed in the production and design of these weapons, it goes on between, behind closed doors in the most excessively testosterone-festered environment you can possibly imagine, which is a military weapons research laboratory. But if we weren't caught up in that, if we could really direct the resources the way we want, we have no idea how rich we are and how perverse our uh, distribution of resources is. I mean, uh, a single F-16 fighter plane, standard equipage, costs $120 million. One of these fighter planes. They order them in lots of 500. If somebody were to give $120 million to the New Age, define that any way you like, or to me, or to you, but that's a lot of money. But if you spend it on a fighter plane, it's not a lot of money. You can park a fighter plane in an area twice the size of this room, and there it sits, useless unless Armageddon should come along. It's about the most useless thing you could do with $120 million. And yet, if you gave that to the sincere, the insincere, the half-sincere, and <laughs> let them all go off and do with it what they want, society would be a much richer place. And many more interesting possibilities would be developed. So, uh, part, part of uh, saving the world, I think, is to make people angry to make people absolutely uh, furious with the way we are being managed. The human enterprise is being managed by idiots. 
And, you know, I don't say they're vindictive idiots, but the case could certainly be made. But give or take that, they're idiots. And we, we don't have forever, you know. In fact, we have, I think, a very short amount of time to take hold and to insist that human values, which none of us have much trouble accessing. I mean, I'm not saying we're all Albert Schweitzer, but we know what it means to be Albert Schweitzer. Why are our institutions unable to project the human values that we personally are able to feel? And then why do we tolerate that? Why are boys in charge of everything? It just doesn't make any kind of sense. Uh, working our way out of this is just going to require shock treatment and that's what this shamanic option represents I mean I wouldn't preach this if I didn't think the situation were fairly desperate it's it's a radical option it's not a reasonable option it's a quick fix because quick is the only fix that counts now this is not a debating society the crisis confronting this planet it's a life or death situation uh, I don't see any other option. Yeah. Charles, is there any value in, in looking at the dichotomy of the self, the, the natural evolutionary self-destruction of a planet, the uh, toxicity, of, toxicity of volcanic eruptions, the ice ages, the uh, shifting of the uh, axis of the, uh, the polar axis and uh, plate tectonics, all that is going on and we seem to be a minor player in the rearrangement of matter in that. Uh, on the planet compared to what it is, what it naturally does itself. And what about that? What about that? Yeah. Well, you're right. Um, the Earth is now understood to be an extremely dynamic environment, um, locally and globally. As a local example that some of you can relate to, t in the last 100,000 years, tidal waves up to 2,000 feet high have occurred locally in the Hawaiian Islands because of sloughing off the face of those islands into deep sea trenches. The International Geophysical Congress has held meetings about this. I've seen the physical evidence of it myself. A 2,000 foot tidal wave, you would shit white if you saw it. I mean, it's just inconceivable, you know. A 50-foot tidal wave is appalling. Uh, on a global scale, 65 million years ago, something crashed down uh, on this planet, and nothing on this planet larger than a chicken walked away from it. You know, dramatic? You bet. This happened between breakfast and lunch one day. Uh, so, yes, I think the, the Earth is a very dynamic place, and part of this psychedelic message is, uh, you know, shake the mud off your shoes, monkeys. You can't always count on it to be like it is. I mean, I mean the mushroom has a kind of a hortatory personality, and it sometimes says things which I don't necessarily agree with that are slightly alarming. I mean, one of its favorite themes is, if you don't have a plan, you're going to end up part of somebody else's plan. And it's speaking to me as a person, it's speaking to human beings as a species. If you don't have a plan, you're going to end up being part of somebody else's plan. The sun has a limited lifespan. There are serious problems with the sun that are not discussed at all much, except in the scientific literature. Uh, it would take major revisions of nuclear theory, which has been in place without revision for nearly 50 years. It would take major revisions of nuclear theory to explain why there isn't something wrong with the sun. The sun is not uh, emitting neutrinos at nearly the rate it should be if it's a healthy atomic furnace. Is it possible that sometime in the last hundred thousand years the nuclear fires of the sun have actually slipped off the main sequence? This is an appalling possibility. You see, if that were to happen, the neutrino flux from the, from the nuclear furnace at the center of the sun would instantly drop uh, 
it would be measured with, within eight minutes on the Earth, the drop in the neutrino flux. But all physical manifestations of this process would not appear for about 70,000 years. The period of time it takes for core solar material to percolate to the surface. So the neutrino drop would be registered virtually instantly, but it would take 70,000 years for any other thing. Well, uh, you know, if that's what's happening, if the sun is, in, is going into some state of instability, well, then we look back in the geological record, and what do you see? Nine times in the past five million years, ice five miles deep has moved south from the poles. Well, what the hell is that about? I mean, you go further back in the record, and you don't find this. People don't realize this. This planet existed for close to five billion years before there was glaciation. Glaciation is a brand new phenomenon on this planet. Why is it happening? Well, the obvious place to look is the energy dynamics of the home star. Is it possible, then, that we're riding an edge more precarious than we know? Is it possible that bios, life on this planet, actually senses limitations and constraints? And that we are, we have been summoned. We are a, we, I, I mentioned stopgap solutions. We are a stopgap solution. <laughs> About two million years ago, the biospheric mind of the planet said, my God, the sun has just gone off the main sequence. We have approximately a million years to organize some kind of uh, arc out of here. A species must be deputized to release energy and to manipulate matter. And this species must be brought forward and made dominant species over the Earth. And out of that technology, we can perhaps fashion an escape. In other words, uh, you know, we are something that has been called forth out of nature because of unusual dynamics on a very large scale. Well, this is a possibility. Um, sure. evolution of the brain, the next evolution, that, uh, I mean, it doesn't make any rational sense, but we don't always make rational sense of it. Um, that, what about the mushroom growing within the brain? I mean, actually not taking it in, but... You mean becoming physically symbiotic? In, in, yeah. Well, um, yeah, I mean, Brian Aldiss wrote a book called The Long Afternoon of Earth, in which he envisioned a human fungal symbiosis that was so close that people actually had a lump on their shoulder and it went directly into the head. Uh, I find this kind of thing a little uh, too uh, creature feature-ish, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> But it is, it, I mean, I have had the notion, it, not a notion, it was more like a delusion at certain times, that, and I can't explain it to you, I will just tell it to you, that uh, there are, th that the really the big secret about human beings is that there are three sexes, male, female, and mushroom. And uh, this third sex is some, I mean, I haven't worked out the genetics of it or how in the world we could have gotten so far without understanding this, but it's that notion that it's wedded into us at that level. And of course, the mushroom, I don't know if it's this way for, for women too, and it, it's, it's subtle, it's smart, it's tricky, 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 and it uses you against yourself, not viciously, it's just very matter-of-factly knows a hundred times more about you than you do yourself. And it presents itself as this 4D girlfriend, you know. It's the, the soror mystica of alchemy. It's the invisible female companion. Yeah. I had a dream a few months ago that uh, I don't know if I gave birth or someone gave birth to these, these children who were like part mushroom 
you know, and they were part fungus, and I felt very loving for, towards them, but they were actually like, you know, beings, you know, but they were like part mushroom and part human. It was all very sweet, you know, it wasn't ghoulish or anything. Well, yeah, I mean, I, the symbiosis is coming together. One of the funny insights that I had that I don't try to make sense of, that I in fact don't believe, but I thought it, and it, it was an emotionally opening thought, though it's absurd on the face of it, was when I was in the Amazon in these pastures, looking at these pastures full of these mushrooms, I kept thinking, you know, it's the lost part of the human brain. It's the part, it's that part of us is in these for in these fields that this this mushroom this this is human flesh this flesh it's a strange kind of human but hell we're about to give legal rights to fetuses we might as well extend legal rights to mushrooms and make them voting citizens uh, because you see it's intelligent it's intelligent it loves you it can blow your mind, it can make you laugh, it can make you cry. Uh, there's no other way to relate to something like that except to love it in spite of yourself. I mean, you know, this is how you seduce someone. You make them laugh, you make them cry, you move them, you get them to drop their barriers, you get them to not be afraid. This is what it does to us. It's it's it seduces us back in to this relationship and i think we return to it with an immense sense of relief it's just like ah oh, you know when i was in guatemala i did not take a deep breath for 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 3 weeks because i could feel the oppression the artificiality of it you know it's in the air the evil and you don't even you get used to it, but when you cross back into Mexico, you just say, "My God, you know what was that?" And and that's what history is for us. You know, we're living under siege conditions here. No wonder it's a little hard to connect up with your higher self. We're living in a foxhole, for God's sake. <laughs> but, you know, if we could realize our situation, then there would be a possibility.